Thank you, Jenny. And good morning to all of you. I think it's still morning. It's 2 p.m. here. I'm in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, and to get started with the presentation, um, a little bit about me. I graduated at the University of Florida in Gainesville back in 2007 with a, um, sorry, a BS in biological engineering. And that was actually my first um, taste of what sustainability is like, because um, with that degree, I participated in two research studies, one of which was the feasibility of using, um, converting used cooking oil from like Burger King or Chinese restaurants um, and converting it into biodiesel that you can put into trucks and school buses. Um, it was really nice because when you would ride behind one of those trucks or school buses, you could smell the French fries or whatever they made that um, biodiesel with, um, as opposed to just a regular fossil fuel type diesel. Another study that I can, uh, participated in was the recycling or reuse of sugar beet tailings. Um, we used um, anaerobic digestion, and if you know the difference between anaerobic and aerobic, anaerobic means without oxygen. And so we put it in this container, sealed it off, let it decay, it created methane. And with that methane, we captured it and we used it as an alternative source for energy and heating. Um, and, and that's not related to building engineering, but that is just, there's just so many different types of sustainable engineering pathways that you can take, not just within building systems. Um, after that, I became a teacher and I taught for seven years. I taught um, about 1000 middle school and high school students. I was also a physics teacher at some point. Um, I got involved with the local school district um, to participate in their conservation advocacy at the classroom and community level. Um, I became a lead accredited professional. I started work networking with um, other people within that chapter and within that group. Um, and then I made a big career change to transition from education, which I loved doing. I loved interfacing with students and I still do, which is why I'm here today. Um, but I transitioned into something that was more aligned with my own passions and my own background in engineering. Um, and having not practiced um, engineering, I started at ground level with the other junior engineers that just graduated from college and I was you know, seven years older than they were. Um, and I was learning a branch of engineering that I did not study myself, which was HVAC design. Um, so I studied for, and it's passed, and I spent probably 200 hours extra, and I, I, you know, put it all on my calendar. I studied and passed both the fundamentals of engineering exam and the professional engineering exam within the past four years. And now I am eligible to submit my documentation to become a professional engineer. Um, and in addition to that, I'm also still involved with the community, um, my local community, USGBC, um, with the schools, school district, and with the city of Jacksonville's resiliency expert, um, efforts. So what drew me into sustainability was um, traveling, actually, getting outside of Florida, outside of the United States, and seeing everything that the world has to offer, because you you don't really see the bubble that you live in until you travel outside of it. Um, you don't see the different kinds of policies that make it possible for sustainable and green design to flourish. Um, so what really inspires me is seeing something abroad or even something in a different city. Like I, what inspired me to get my lead green associate was um, I went into a, a sandwich shop in Chicago and it had had all this stuff about lead uh, design. And so I, I decided, hey, why not? I have a summer to kill. I studied for that test. I passed the test and I've never looked back. Um, so what does it mean to be sustainable? And I know that some of you were saying that you do not have Microsoft accounts. Um, you can participate in the chat if you can't participate through Pear Deck. Um, but there is a question, what does it mean to be sustainable? And what does that mean to you? to be sustainable. So go ahead and enter your responses into um, either the chat or into Pear Deck. And we'll review those responses in a moment. Um, 
to me, sustainability, well, not to me, but the, the textbook definition of sustainability is rooted in three, the three Ps, people, planet, and profit. Um, because something can be, um, it can be great for the planet, but if it's not economical, if it's not accessible to people, then it's not sustainable because you can't implement it into your, um, into your working society, if that makes any sense. Um, so you can have like a great design, but if it costs too much, then nobody's gonna implement it. Or if it's far out of reach for everybody to access, then nobody's going to implement it. And ultimately sustainability is something that is implementable, something that is accessible, something that is, um, that does its justice to the planet and is something that is also um, profitable. And I know that when I try to communicate with other people who aren't necessarily like the, you know, green into any, everything that's green, they still look at what's our bottom line. And when you can communicate with them that investing in green energy or green systems can give you more money in the long run, um, that speaks to them. So let's see what our responses are. Okay, benefits to almost everyone and everything. Um, something that continues without consequence, a sustainable practice is built, that is a great quote. Um, I wish I knew who said that. <laughs> a sustainable practice is built to last generations. Um, to be sustainable means to save money, energy, and nature, absolutely. Um, to be cautious of how um, we uh, create something to benefit the planet while benefiting society, yes. Something that is able to be maintained, absolutely. Um, uh, let's see, something that is good for the planet and the people living on it. I'm not sure, and that is okay. That's what we're trying to learn today is trying to figure out what sustainability means. Um, being sustainable means that humans and the earth can coexist, absolutely. Both benefiting from each other without consequences needs to be good for the society and profitable and good for the environment. Great responses, guys. Okay, so let's move on to designing for sustainability. And this touches on lead and the other um, aspects of green building design in particular. Actually, let me see, was this the right slide? What is something, I think, I'm missing a slide, it's okay. Um, so in the early mid nineties, the US Green Building Council was established and it defined the standard that building professionals use today, which is the lead rating system. And it consists of eight different categories. Um, it incorporates sustainable architectural and engineering building design practices to optimize energy output and reduce carbon dioxide emissions. Um, so let's delve into a bit of what exactly is going on here with a green building. So location, for instance, it's something that, um, to have a sustainable building, you ask yourself, is it easy to access? Is it centrally located? Is it walkable? Is it near other things that you would go to like, like a grocery store or your post office or the library? Is it walkable? Is it near public transit? Do you have to use your car? You, like these days we don't want to use our car if we absolutely have to because we know that conventional cars produce a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so we look at all those things in terms of location. For sustainable sites, we look at um, do they promote other types of transportation like bicycling? Do they have bike racks? Um, does it have renewable energy on it like solar panels? Uh, is it made out of materials that reflect heat and light away? You know, like if you have a building that is um, a lighter in color, it will absorb less heat and thus reduce energy to, that it takes for air conditioning and cooling? Does it have a green roof? Does it collect rainwater? Um, oh, and then it leads into water efficiency. How much water does your building use? Are we, um, do we have water saving equipment like Energy Star appliances? Um, I'm in the market actually for a new washing machine that uses less water. Um, and the, the, the problem is that it costs $1,500. The one that uses the least amount of water uses $1,500. And then there's the one from Home Depot that I can get right away for 
but it uses three times as much water. So when I did a cost analysis of it, um, between the two washing machines, I'm actually saving more money in the long run. After two years, I the $1,500 washing machine ends up being cheaper because I don't have to pay as much on my water bill. So that's just a little bit of the eight different categories that we design for when it's uh, in terms of lead. So green buildings can reduce your energy usage um, if you're using the right type of materials for glass, uh, for your insulation, for your walls, your doors, your roof. Um, if you are using materials that have a lower, a lower carbon dioxide emissions, water usage, and oh, if you're using a lot of recycled material. And, um, and if you promote recycling within your uh, facility, you can drive solid waste down by 70%. And the next generation of green buildings is actually going to be a net zero building, which I really look forward to seeing. Um, these will be buildings that produce as much energy as they consume, um, or they're not producing any additional strain to our water or energy infrastructure. So a little bit about my company. Uh, we are located in the Southeast region. We started in Florida. So we have about um, five or six offices here in Florida, um, but we do have offices as far north as Chicago and Philadelphia and offices as far west as Dallas. And we offer um, a lot of different, uh, an array of engineering services, which include mechanical, electrical and plumbing uh, building design. So we work with the piping, everything that you see in your buildings an engineer has, has touched, has thought of, has implemented, has planned for. Um, structural engineering, we do, um, we make it resilient to hurricane force winds and structural is especially important in your neck of the woods since you are also prone to a lot of um, seismic activity. We also, oh, we uh, work with Disney quite a bit and Universal in designing their um, roller coasters. So we make sure that we minimize the vibration on those roller coasters and rides so that we're giving a great experience for their, um, for their patrons. Uh, technology, Im there are technology engineers that implement computers and, and all these other experiences into the building, access codes, security, um, all of that. We also have life safety and fire protection. So these are engineers that focus just on your, pl um, the plumbing related to um, if there's a fire, you have your fire sprinkler, the means of egress, how are um, the building occupants going to evacuate in the event of some kind of um, code red event? And then we also have acoustic engineering's, um, engineers that work on the sound that carries within that space. You can imagine that the acoustics for a hospital room is very different than the acoustics for a theater or a classroom. Um, so we have engineers that look at what type of insulation, how this room is shaped in, um, in order to best design for that facility. I'll skip that. Um, so going into energy services, this is a very new um, department that our firm has. And we, focus, we are focused on optimizing um, energy usage, basically, energy usage of a building. So we perform activities such as commissioning, energy audits, lead administration. We work with Energy Star portfolio and manager. Um, we provide energy modeling services, renewable energy initiatives, and um, net operating income improvements. So I'll talk about different types of roles and um, activities that these different types of people do within my firm. And I'll also talk a bit about what uh, level of education, what the basic level of education you need in order to perform that role, um, the additional um, certifications you would need, and also the type of salary that you might be able to expect 
from a position of this nature. So firstly, I'm gonna talk about energy modeling and it has a question, what type of heat transfer contributes to the greatest warming of a building during the day? Um, and there are four answer options and I cannot remember the um, order in which they are, but I do remember that one of them is, let's see, convection, radiation, um, conduction, and I think the last one was evaporation. So which one contributes to the greatest amount of heating in the space during the day? Um, and while you are answering that on Pear Deck, I'll talk a little bit about um, energy modeling. So in energy services, we develop energy models in order to compare potential solutions to the life cycle cost set um, so that we give owners um, uh, high performance building solutions. Typically, this is performed by an engineer. Their starting salary is around $50,000. Their average salary is around $75,000. Um, and in order to become a building engine, or sorry, it's building energy modeling professional, and they're called BEMPs, you would need at least two years of modeling experience if you have an engineering degree. However, I think you can also have just a high school diploma and 10 years of experience um, in order to become a building energy modeling professional. So this is not something that would require a college degree to obtain, but you still need a lot of on the job training and experience with it. Um, in 2018, the Jamaican government hosted an international design competition, which we participated in. Um, this, this building did not actually get built, um, but we participated in this competition that um, all of Jamaica basically was able to participate in voting on. And so our design, or not our design, but we we supported the, um, it's called Synchro Corporation out of Houston. We supported them in, by providing them an energy model that you'll see here. Okay, so let's see what our responses are. Okay, A, evaporation, one vote, radiation, conduction, and most of you voted convection. Oh, I saw another person vote radiation. Okay, so radiation actually, so the three types of heat transfer are radiation, conduction, and convection. And the one that produces the most amount of um, moisture issues and mold is convection. So we have to plan around that. But the heat transfer that produces the most heat in a building, especially during the daytime, is radiative from the sun. So that should have been the hint. It happens only during the daytime. Um, and I'll show you what one of our energy models looks like. Let me try to pull this up. Okay. So this easily took 100, 150 hours or so, um, probably 200. I was not the one that did this model. However, it, it does look, if you look at the detail, um, the end result helps simulate daily conditions, daylight conditions throughout the year. And you can see as the sun moves, the shadows that are cast throughout the day. And when you get in more closely, you see the X-shaped columns um, that are architectural and they look really cool and funky, but they also help cast a lot of shade on the interior of the building. And um, these columns, along with the extended overhang from the roof, help block a lot of direct sunlight and the infrared radiation that comes along with it um, so that there is a substantial reduction from their baseline cooling load. The interior of the building still has a lot of glass, so the occupants of the building would additionally benefit from a reduced lighting bill because there's a lot of sunlight during the day without all the heating. So moving on, uh, commissioning. So this can be performed by someone with an um, AA degree, 
but also has a deep knowledge and experience in HVAC systems, electrical and lighting design, as well as plumbing. Uh, typically, this is obtained through on-the-job training. So they would need, at very minimum, a commissioning technician certification. Again, the starting salary is around 45000 and the average salary is 75000 so uh, this is commissioning is a quality focused process for enhancing the delivery of a project. The process focuses on verifying by seeing and documenting the facility and all of its systems and assemblies that are planned, designed, installed, tested and operated and maintained to meet the owner's requirements for that facility. So what we do is we look at an engineer's designs Typically, all of these different engineers that work on a project are working independently of each other. The mechanical person does not talk to the electrical person, and they don't talk to the plumbing person, and they don't talk to fire protection, um, and then in, they barely talk to the architect. So we're lucky if they're all coordinating with each other. And a lot of the time we see equipment and ductwork and piping and conduit and all these things placed over each other. So we need to ensure as commissioning authorities that these issues are addressed and resolved. Oh my goodness. Oh, sorry. The lighting turned off. Um, so, um, in addition, we ensure different equipment work together as a part of the building system. For instance, with solar panels, we construct startup checklists and performance tests to make sure that in the event of a power outage, it seamlessly integrates with the backup energy system in place. If there's a generator, we also make sure that the building energy needs are met first by the solar panel and the battery storage um, and that they are in place and before having to turn on the generator. We additionally make sure that the system is right size for the uh, solar panels and if they are existing solar panels, we can commission those as well to make sure that they're still performing correctly, um, that they're still converting energy, um, that there's still this high rate of energy conversion based off of their solar intensity and energy output. Um, and we make sure that they're not generating too much heat, um, especially at this time of the year for you in California. Um, we don't want equipment that's potentially going to spark and cause a forest fire. So two buildings that we have here um, are the University of Florida Hebner Hall, which is a new classroom building at the Warrington School of Business. Um, this was a job that we commissioned and achieved lead gold. And let's see, it was a, does it say the, Stats on it? No, it does not. Okay, so it's 57,000 square feet. Oh, yes, it does. Okay, 57,000 square feet, $16.7 million job. Um, what you see to the right of it is the piping of the chilled water into the building. And this water is drawn from a district chilled water loop that allows um, all the air, the conditioned air, to cool down and this was their air conditioning system for the building was that chilled water. Okay, the second example that I have is the University of Florida indoor practice facility. This is where the University of Florida Gators play in the event of inclement weather or um, extreme heat days. They also um, utilize the space to practice um, in they have these sound systems that emulate a crowd, a, a large crowd that they would typically play in during no non-COVID years. So it has a, a noise of an audience really loud and they project it from their audio systems um, along the perimeter of the building. So we participated in the commissioning of that audio system as well as their lighting and their HVAC. And the lighting, when I say commissioning lighting, um, most of the time you're flipping switches on and off, which is, I mean, it's kind of fun, brainless work. But in this situation, there was this huge panel of light switches and you have to make sure that 
you know, when it, you increase it gradually, it also increases gradually that if there's a timer, it turns off at the appropriate time, that the right light switch is associated with the right light fixture. So it was um, probably half a day event just to make sure all those lights were associated with those with that lighting panel. Oh, there it is. Sorry, my slides are a little bit out of order. So if you remember earlier, I talked about um, designing for lead. Another position that you can have within energy services is to be a lead administrator. And as a lead administrator, you do not need a college degree. You can in fact get um, lead accredited in high school um, and take the test at home as long as you have the right, your computer has the right requirements for it. So you could potentially enter into college with a lead, um, a lead, what's it called, green associate, um, and, and gain a lot more experience when you're in college and it really sets you up for the next level. Um, but as a lead, let's see, sorry. An, a lead accreditation adds 5,000 to $20,000 to your salary. Um, and we at TLC have participated in lead administration for over 450 projects. As a lead administrator, you would gather the owner, the architects, engineers, construction team in a lead charrette at the very beginning of the project, ideally before the building has even been designed, um, to discuss sustainability goals and features that your building would have. So it is the lead administrator's responsibility to participate in meetings throughout design and construction phase to ensure that these elements are not forgotten or left off of the project. And then if you have team members that are not experienced, you also have to bring them up to speed and provide them support as, ne as needed. Um, and usually things get left off when you're dealing with people who are inexperienced or when you're dealing with budget constraints and something gets left off because it's um, perceived to be expensive. Um, as the lead administrator, you can't push your own agenda. You have to follow with what everybody else has agreed to. But you still need to ensure and advocate for that uh, the majority of the sustainability goals remain intact so that they can cross the finish line with that lead plaque that they set their sights on. So for UCF, University of Central Florida in Orlando, we have a continuing lead administration services with them. Here are four buildings. Um, and I think we have helped them achieve 11 certifications so far, eight gold and three silver. So um, energy auditing, and I believe this is a pair deck question so you can participate by answering the following question. What percentage of buildings are existing buildings? So while you're entering that question into pair deck, or in through the Zoom group chat, and it's a percentage number, so it's anywhere between zero and 100. I did have somebody who entered in 106, that's not right. Um, energy audits, I'm gonna talk a little bit about energy audits and then we'll cycle back around. Energy audits can be performed by persons without a college degree, but attainment of this certification also takes seven years Whereas if you have a STEM degree, you only need two to four years of experience based off of the type of degree and other certifications. Um, I ha myself have participated in five energy audits so, for so far over the past four years. And once I get my professional engineering license, I'll be eligible to take this test as well. So we go into the site, we evaluate the en building envelope, which are the walls, the doors, the windows, the glazing, the roof, and all the other existing equipment and their conditions. Um, and then we make these recommendations for energy conservation, and we call these energy conservation measures. So we also calculate the measures um, and how much it takes to implement these versus the amount of inefficiency that their current design and their current systems have. And some of these conservation measures are as simple as changing your building thermostat settings. Um, sometimes it's just changing all of the light bulbs to efficient LEDs. 
Um, it could also be more involved, like changing the windows or the glazing or the glass to make it more efficient. Um, but it also could involve changing out the entire HVAC system. So usually when we are performed to do an audit, there are a, um, a numerous amount of problems in that building taking place that's driving up their energy bill. And now let's look at your answers to see if anybody got it right. Nobody in the chat. Um, and nobody got it right. Anybody else know? Okay, so the correct answer is 100%. 100% of buildings are existing buildings. It's a trick question. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. Somebody got it right now. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to give you, um, oh, actually, I'll, this is Jacksonville, which is where I'm from, but I'll show you the more glitzy one. We don't always get to do energy audits on buildings like this. Most of the time, energy audits are performed on office buildings, schools, hospitals, and so on. But every once in a while, you're lucky enough to get a five-star resort and a getaway destination. Um, so an ASHRAE level two audit was uh, performed all over the entire resort complex to improve energy efficiency and reduce their operating costs. Um, this is a 285,000 square foot building and we identified viable energy conservation measures, including recommendations to optimize their HVAC system, uh, which es was estimated to save them $755,000 annually. And it provided a simple payback of 2.3 years. So the cost of getting that new HVAC for hiring us, for doing um, the, the demolition work and the construction work to put the HVAC into place, was paid back in 2.3 years by the amount of savings that they were able to achieve after that new system was operational. Um, so that concludes my presentation. I do wanna finish with this. As we focus on what we need to do to curb the acceleration of climate change, one thing you'll hear a lot of is modernization of building infrastructure. Remember, buildings account for over 30% of CO2 emissions. As we continue to design new buildings and maintain our existing buildings, there will be a greater demand for uh, sustainability leaders like you in energy services to move the needle, to change convention, and to make change. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Amanda. Great presentation. Um, we are going to hop right into some of the questions that we <clears throat> received um, from students prior to this class. Um, so get ready. Uh, from Allende Turner, I hope I'm saying your name right. What tasks did you complete to get in the position you are in now? I'm sorry, what task? Task. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so it, to get into the position that I am in now, um, I did not have the right um, background for it. Like I said, I majored in biological engineering. However, um, my employer saw in me a passion for sustainability and engineering and design um, that was aligned with their core values for this company. Um, so I worked hard, again, starting from ground level to, um, to get certifications in um, as a lead green, what is it, lead uh, accredited professional in building design and operations management. I also committed over 200 hours to study for the fundamentals of engineering exam and the professional engineering exam, which are not required to take as an engineer, but it does enhance your um, portfolio, makes you more marketable, and it also provides you um, a greater growth within your company. Great, thank you. Um, so <clears throat> Hector asks, 
what are some important aspects to building a green classroom? That's a great question. Um, what we see traditionally is that schools are aged. They are over 50 years old. Um, they need desperate repair. And, and, and it's not even just green infrastructure. They just need better functioning infrastructure. Um, and what we need to see is buildings designed to last because that's what schools are. They don't get touched you know, for decades basically until something falls apart and then, then hopefully there's something in the school budget to build it again. So the first thing is that they need to make it built to last. Um, sometimes that means building it above a certain sea level rise, you know, a, a certain feet above ground. Um, sometimes that means building it with, um, for us in Florida, we have to make sure the, the walls are able to withstand um, a certain amount of wind. And in California, it means you want to build it to be flame, as um, resilient to forest fires and resilient to seismic activity. Um, and then to make it more green, you want to reduce its energy usage. So that means maybe putting the windows, you, you, windows are great. Windows actually enhance a student's uh, ability to learn. We, being able to see outside and see greenery helps a student learn and focus better. But if that window is facing a certain way, it can also heat up a room a lot quicker. So you have to be mindful about where you're placing your windows. What kind of insulation are you using? Um, and are your, sustainability, your features, your, um, your features of sustainability being used as educational tools for your students. Do, does, your does your teacher and does your school um, talk about recycling? Do they talk about how to save water? Do they talk about how the lighting in your room are LED light bulbs? Or even just switching off the, the lights when you leave the room? Great, yeah, um, you did a great job talking about green schools. Um, one more question, maybe maybe one that you can answer in just one minute. Um, what, this one's from Morgan. What is a green engineer's main goal? A green engineer's main goal is to meet the client demand, um, which isn't always green, but you wanna be able to help them see where green um, infrastructure can support what their own goals for their facility is. Great, thank you. Um, 